Welcome to Tales from the Void Above, a podcast that takes you to the farthest reaches of the galaxy, where the only limit is your imagination. Each week, we'll drop you into the heart of a new adventure, following characters struggling to survive in a universe filled with danger, betrayal, and the promise of untold riches. Whether it's a lone pilot on a desperate mission or a crew of misfits taking on a job too big for them to handle, there's always a new chapter unfolding. So strap in, pilot. New episodes release every Saturday, taking you deeper into the unknown. You might even catch a few short stories midweek, packed with quick thrills and twists you won't see coming. Join us on Tales from the Void Above, where survival is never guaranteed, and every story begins with a leap into the unknown. friends, your old pal Billy Dean Shoemate III here, and welcome back to Strange Places. This podcast is brought to you by Asylum 817 Productions, Spotify, and DistroKid. I'm in my 40s, and I guess it's natural at this age to start thinking about my own mortality. And when I think about my own mortality, for some reason, U.S. Elevator keeps creeping up in my head. Now, why would I... <laughs> not only make an episode about a company that literally built elevators, and why would it creep up when I think about my own mortality? This company, founded in 1967, closed in 1991, built elevators. Why would I make an episode about this place? Well, in this story here, I do have a very small part to play. And I'm gonna change names, I'm gonna change dates, I'm gonna change things a little bit because dynamics with the people that are still around are quite touchy, to say the least. But this is a story I think that needs to be told. And in recent years, I've kind of started thinking about the place itself, U.S. Elevator. This isn't a personal story, but it's one, like I said, I have uh, a very small part to play in. U.S. Elevator was acquired by the Cubic Corporation in 1970. U.S. Elevator Corp. was probably the first, well, the first, actually, based on my research. Thank you, elevator enthusiasts. I didn't know that was a thing. But elevator enthusiasts online have built websites and histories and all that stuff. I didn't know that. I guess there's an enthusiast for everything. So thank you (laughs) for drudging up some of the information that um, I wouldn't have known otherwise. They were the first to put a microprocessor in an elevator. The very first. They were innovators. In 1986, U.S. acquired Central Elevator Company. In 1994, Cubic Corporation was negotiating to sell U.S. Elevator Corp. That ended up happening. But for a time, this place built elevators for some of the biggest companies in the world. They built luxury elevators. Like I said, they were innovators. They invented things that we still use today and such a thing that we overlook. You know, you step inside an elevator all the time, but we never think about the engineering that goes behind it. As I said, I have a very small part to play here and I'm not gonna tell you exactly what part it is to play because, you know, again, those dynamics are touchy at best. These people don't get along now. And it it, it is sad, but Much like U.S. elevator closing, times change. I do remember the feeling in that place. Especially after hearing stories from the employees there. I was related to one of them. And, you know, as a younger guy, (laughs) I, you know, was afraid to go in the place because I'd always heard the stories sightings of full-blown apparitions, shadow people in the corners, weird sounds, things being moved overnight when there was nobody there. 
whispers in empty hallways. Strange feelings, feelings of overwhelming sadness or dread. Fleeting glimpses out the corner of your eye. I heard all these stories about this place. So when, you know, my family member had to be picked up from work or it was a, you know, (laughs) family day or some kind of potluck or whatever they were having, I just, I always had a weird feeling in that place. And I, I chalk it up to the stories. And my family member worked nights and occasionally, you know, we would have to go pick them up. And any place, you know, to a freaking 12 year old when it's dark, it's scary. But it was those stories that really got to me. And it's always been in the back of my head, but it goes much, much deeper than that. There was a, a strange kind of aura about the place, a strange kind of vibe. and. You know, it it could have been because of the story, subconsciously making me think that there was something wrong with this place. So I decided it's about time that we, this podcast lives up to its name (laughs) and we talk about a strange place. I know strange places is kind of a catch all for everything paranormal, but let's do a strange place this week. U.S. Elevator, San Diego, California, which is sadly no more. If you go out there today, The landscape is completely different than what I remember. I looked it up on Google Maps and I didn't even recognize it, but I knew that was the address. The Balboa area, um, right there on Balboa Boulevard in San Diego, not far from Balboa Park where I grew up. U.S. Elevator, a name that sounds mundane to you, but one that scares the hell out of me. Now I got kind of a treat here for you, although Everybody that I interviewed declined to provide a recording to be on this podcast. That just shows you, like I said, the dynamic surrounding these people. I've been researching this episode for over a year, and I had no intention of putting it on strange places. It's just always been something that's fascinated me, and I kind of wanted answers. But really, this is the episode here that I've researched more than any other episode. I've researched the happenings there and been fascinated by it my entire life. U.S. Elevator was a weird, weird place, (laughs) and a lot of weird things happened there. I've been witness to a couple of them. I wrote a book about it, actually, and no, this is not a plug thing, okay? (laughs) This is not a shameless plug. I'm not going to make a, you know, 40-minute episode just to plug something I did. On June 17th, 2011, I released a novel called The Shaman. It is based on a true story. And it's, I wouldn't say loosely based. A lot of it is pretty damn factual. I changed a lot of names. I changed a lot of places, you know, just to keep my privacy intact and those of everybody around me. And plus, The Shaman is one of those books where the craziest shit where you think, oh, there's no way this could be true. That's the stuff that's factual. And it was the mundane stuff that I kind of had to fill in. Granted, I didn't base it on U.S. Elevator. I gave it a fictional, you know, business name, but it was based on the happenings in U.S. Elevator. So check it out sometime. See, there's the plug. (laughs) But yeah, I did write a book about it called The Shaman by Billy Dean Shumate III. I'll put a link in the... Um, description if anybody wants to take a look at it but it was based on the events that happened there now why did I call it the shaman well there was a lot of just to give you some history here as far as the grounds go it used to be a Spanish settlement and the Native Americans that were in that area which Native Mexican Americans they were kicked out of the area now I hate to sound bitter here, but I have a lot of Native American in me myself. And instead of the European settlers that came here that left the Native Americans to rot where they fell, the Spanish had at least the respect to bury their dead. And Balboa Park was where most of those Native Americans were buried and the grounds surrounding it. The Mexicans, they have their own tales and legends about that area, specifically around, you know, Old Town San Diego. We know all about that, the Whaley House. But 
the Spanish settlement and the atrocities that happened there on those grounds, the Native Americans, the Native Mexicans, even the you know Mexican people today, they consider that place not one to be avoided, but one to be careful. Not to watch your back, but to watch your soul. A place that is still hurting and still remembering. That's how they see it, the Balboa area. If you go and talk to the oldest cats you can find, the oldest Native Americans and the oldest Mexican people in the area, that's what they'll tell you. At the gatherings and at the lunches and at the days out and weekends and all that, we heard the stories about how strange U.S. Elevator was and the weird things that just kept happening there. I interviewed three employees that are you know, former employees, obviously, that are still around. All three of them declined to be on this podcast, though these are people that I've known for a long time and they wished me the best. But though they spoke to me freely, well, two of them did. One was kind of kind of cagey and I don't blame them. Aside from what was seen in that building and what was felt in that building, though the guys that worked there, I think the most notable stories are the ones that should be mentioned. One of my family members was walking home one night and he had just had a, a baby. Like this kid was I don't know, barely a month old, a little bit younger than I am. But he was walking home. It was late at night. And he was approached by a couple of Mexican gang members. They pulled a gun on him and they demanded his money. And his money wasn't enough. They said they were going to straight up kill him. He begged for his life. He asked if he could pull something out of his pocket and showed all of them pictures of his newborn baby. Normally, they really wouldn't give a shit. <laughs> These are gang members, and he was on their turf. On ours, he was not supposed to be walking around there. It was a dangerous area back then. Now it's okay. But even the photo of the newborn didn't shake them. One of the men looked right in my family member, let's call him Joe, looked right in Joe's eyes and said, there's something wrong about you. He goes, what? <laughs> my family member, Joe, he's like, huh? What, what are you talking about? And one of the gang members said, you've got the devil in you. That place, you work there, don't you? Joe said, yeah. He goes, that place is evil. He straight up told Joe, that place is evil. He looked at the other two guys, gang members with guns. Late at night, no witnesses. He backed the other guys off. We need to leave. There's something wrong here. They were afraid of him. Just this normal blue collar worker with his little lunch pail, you know, <laughs> walking home, tired after a long day's work. It's a true story. They looked in Joe's eyes and they noticed something amiss, something wrong, something that I think their culture recognized. And those words always stood out to me. You've got the devil in you. And he said that. Joe told me, like they were, you know, kept whispering the word Diablo. He's got the devil in him. You know? And that place is evil. There was another incident that happened there around the same time. <laughs> A family friend of ours, his name was Art. He was a lovely man. He was an incredible guy, a character. He was hilarious, cheeky, rambunctious. He was a Native American, full-blooded Native American. And he always had stories for the, he would share these old stories, you know, with his fellow employees and stuff. And he loved us kids, he loved us. He had an archery class when I was younger, taught archery. I was never into it myself, but I thought it was cool. And he taught all the co-workers, families, kids, archer. I was never into it, really. You know, I just kind of sat on the sidelines. I, I was there. I hung out. He gave us all, all the kids, he gave us all Native American names based on our, you know, personality and, you know, this stuff like that, like how you're supposed to name fucking people. <laughs> but he gave us all Native American names. He was a Swedish guy. He ended up getting cancer. And this is back, well, I, like I said, to protect people, let's change some dates. 
this was near the closure of U.S. Elevator. Or was it? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. But he ended up getting cancer. He was very, very sick. And he decided to still come to work every day. He wanted to work there with his friends until he just had nothing left. He had no family, nobody to take care of. He lived very simply. That was his reason for staying at work. He wanted to live out the rest of his days with the people that he liked. He loved his job. These guys built elevators for a living, but this was a long time ago. This was back when, you know, you could smoke at work and maybe knock back something out of a flask if you're having a shitty day. You know what I mean? This was a different time. And he worked there until he had nothing left. And even on the last day, the people I interviewed and Joe, he said he was just skeletal near the end. He got to the point where he physically could not do it anymore. One day, this was weeks later, one day, everybody's going to work and my family member Joe and an old family friend Ray who I still talk to there was this big hill that overlooked the parking lot of US elevator he had the main building which ironically looked like an elevator and it was surrounded by this huge these huge hills those hills aren't even there anymore it's amazing to look at because I remember these huge hills, you know, that are damn near vertical. And if you ran down the thing, you'd be ass over tea cuddle in a second. So they're going to work one day, Ray and Joe and all the other employees, Everett, Daryl, Ray. Everett, Daryl, and Ray, those are their real names, by the way. <laughs> they let me use them. And the office employees, Tiffany, Amber, not real names, they looked up on the hill and they saw art. Joe told me, as well as Ray that I interviewed here recently, it was nice to talk to him again. Art was dressed in all white. He wasn't skeletal looking, he looked great. He had a big smile on his face, his hair, which was usually tied back or in braids, was hanging loose down to his waist. And he was waving at all of them, a big smile on his face. Just so happy to see them waving at him, like a little kid just waving. Joe and Ray ran up that hill because they hadn't seen Art in a while. They wanted to talk to him. Fuck work. How's my friend? So they went up there. Art was nowhere to be seen. They thought it was pretty odd. Work day goes on like normal. Art's wife calls. He had died the day before. And... All of them were just like, no, 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 we, something's, no, you, some date's messed up or somebody told us wrong. Maybe she's all, maybe she's emotional. She's keyed up, you know, something's wrong. We saw, we just saw him today. No, it was confirmed Art had died the day before. And all those men, even to this day, swear that Art was on that hill waving goodbye. One of the sweetest men I ever met. One of the most kind-hearted people I've ever met in my life. He would pick up the kids when they were little and he would teach them stories. He would tell them stories of the old ways. He was always so, what's the word I'm looking for? He was always so generous with his culture, with how ancient his stories were. And he was always so sharing with them. He wanted that stuff to stay alive. It wasn't long after that until, and you'll read this in The Shaman, it wasn't long after that until one of the employee's sons, let's, let's call him Bob. Bob's son, like I said about my age, a little bit younger, he started getting up at night, sitting in front of his closet, an open closet. He would just sit there and stare at his closet, fascinated. Like he was looking at something just unfathomable, but it wasn't, it didn't appear to scare him. He had the same look on his face as if, you know, when he was being taught in school. This kid was only in like first grade at the time. He had that same look on his face when he was learning something that he really liked in school, sitting in front of his closet, dead of night, nothing in there. Bob would come home, like, hey kid, what are you doing? Go to bed. Like I said, this is, you know, a kid who's barely into first grade. And eventually he started saying these words. 
that nobody could make out. And they think, okay, he's a little too old, you know, for babbling and <laughs> doing that kind of thing. So they they didn't think much of it. They just thought, oh, man, maybe it's a phase. I mean, he's, he's, he's in his own little world, you know what I mean? He's babbling to himself. And it wasn't until they went to his grandmother's house. Now, this is one of the small parts that I play here. I just happened to be there that day, and I actually remember this. He started babbling these words again. So his grandma says, where did you learn that stuff? Because she, she just thought it was odd. She's like, these sound like words. These sound like actual words here. He's not just blah, 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 blah. He's making sentences. He's saying something. And she said, where'd you learn this? And he said, the medicine man in my closet. He comes and sees me at night. But when he goes away, I can't remember anything. Just what he said, just words. And I could just imagine her blood chilling, you know, with all the other weirdness going around with UF's elevator and other things at the time. Maybe I'll make episodes on someday. But, you know, what? <laughs> What's going on? The medicine man who lives in my closet. He comes and sees me every night and teaches me things. What does he teach you? I don't remember. What does he look like? I don't remember. I just remember certain words. It just so happened that his grandmother, who had a little bit of background in that herself, had an old book of Native American words and phrases. And she found them. He was saying words like sunrise, moonrise, the fire in your heart, kunapita, which is a word that they used for love. The fire in your heart, kunapita, uyuhaide meka. All men are brothers. They thought it was pretty weird. They thought it was pretty frightening, as anybody would. But obviously, whatever this boy was talking to, whether he had an imaginary friend or there was some Native American ghost visiting him, what this thing was teaching him seemed like it was all good. And it kind of put them in a weird sense of peace. So anyway, this is this started happening, started happening when art was still there and working. I know I told this a little bit backwards, but art was still around when a lot of this was happening. So naturally, the first person they go to is art. And Art said, this story goes back thousands of years. And keep in mind, your boy is speaking a dead language. Nobody knows this language anymore. This is probably the only place you're ever going to find this, this kind of stuff is in, you know, these old 18th, you know, 1800s books like, you know, his grandma had. He said, this is essentially a dead language. So he said, this story goes back a long time, a long time before a white man ever set foot here and long before that there was a legend about a medicine man who the tribes people would give their children to him and he would hold the child when they were just born and he would be able to look inside their souls and know what they were going to do when they grew up this one's going to be a warrior this one you need to keep home with the women this one you need to, you know, this one's going to be a chief. You know, this one should be a medicine man like me. This one, he would know. And before he died, he promised that he would continue his work. And in his own words, fly on the winds of time forever and teach children about the old ways and continue his work. Not only the old ways, he would teach these children that he said would change the world one day. Children that he had personally selected, ones that were going to completely turn the world around and change things forever. The, the ones that he saw as important in the grand scheme. He was going to teach them about, this is what Art said, he was going to teach them about love, about patience, about you know all the good things about being human the old ways and how to respect nature and respect your brother and respect yourself all good stuff and art said someday the spirit is going to go away and your child is not going to remember a thing except what he was taught in a way it's going to be almost kind of permeated through him he's going to be imbued with it he'll even forget the words sure enough after a couple weeks where did the medicine man go honey He's gone. He went away. 
Do you remember what he looked like? No, I don't remember. Do you remember what he said to you? No, not really. But the child was changed after that. Had a, and I remember it too. It was he was a different kid afterward. Just had a amazing respect for nature and life, and very very spiritual after that. Even at that age, it was amazing. And since then, uh, I wish I could tell you who this person is, but as far as what he's done and what he's accomplished, I would be willing to bet he's going to change the world someday. But that's not all. And that's, you know, what the shaman was written about. That's not all, man. <laughs> Seeing art up on that hill a day after he died. All this strangeness, the, the near mugging and these guys backing off and backing each other off, saying the place is evil, you've got the devil in you. The medicine man story, which fascinated me enough to write a book about. The weirdness, the sightings in there, all the strange things happening. I've heard these stories my whole life growing up. And I know that these people are strangers to you. So I can't, I can't convince you that people like Ray and people like Joe, what they say, you can take it to the bank. They do not bullshit. These are <laughs> still to this day. These are burly, gruff, <laughs> you know, former elevator workers who still you know drink on weekends and smoke cigars and they're a rowdy bunch of guys but what they say you can take to the fucking bank they don't make up tall tales and stories but uh, granted these people are strangers to you you don't know them i do the feeling in that place was really strange and researching the grounds of it i have looked high and low my whole life about this Native American legend. I've looked up the words, I've looked up all this. I could never find anybody else it ever happened to. Do I believe it? Yes, I do. I do. Because like I said, I'm a first-hand witness to some of it. And you'll see it in the book too, but I, I've got to protect people's privacy. And the unfortunate dynamic between all these people now. And I'm not just saying they don't get along and it's touchy. There's legal stuff there too. I mean. A lot, of, a lot of things have changed, sadly. The grounds of U.S. Elevator are unrecognizable now. But when you get older, when I got older, I started not attributing it so much to... Because you, know, you would think maybe art spurred a lot of this on with him being Native American, spiritual. Maybe he was visiting the boy. I don't know. Theories go through your head like crazy. But then I start researching the building. And this was only... A year ago that I started making the link between what was going on there and the U.S. elevator grounds itself. I always just thought it was kind of a spiritual place. Maybe it was art, you know, maybe it was something. But U.S. elevator, let me give you a little bit of history as far as their luxury elevators, where their luxury elevators ended up. Okay. All right. And this is just a few. The Presidio Park, Mission Hills area has their luxury elevators everywhere. The University of Arizona's old main building, Wrigley Mansion in Phoenix, California, the Casa Palermo, California State University, the Hotel Del Coronado, V Hotel California, if you've ever heard the song, Illinois, Congress Plaza Hotel, the Peggy uh, Nothbart, I never say that right, Nature Museum in Chicago, Texas, Parkland Hospital, Moreno Elementary School, Virginia, Landmark Mall Parking Deck, Elmwood, El Elmwood Park Garage. I know I'm rapid firing this, but there's so many I got to get through it. Uh, Washington, D.C., the Octagon House, the Hay Adams Hotel. These are their luxury elevators, okay? The innovative ones, the ones where they used weird technology at the time. The kind of one-off elevators. Best Western Atlanta Airport, Crown Plaza Airport Hotel. This is in St. Louis and Georgia, uh, Country Inn and Suites, Asheville, North Carolina, and the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado. Does the Stanley Hotel sound familiar to you? Yeah, that's the hotel that The Shining was based off of. I was like, that's kind of cool. They put one of their luxury elevators in a place that ended up haunted. And then you start looking. Every one of those places Every one of those places I just mentioned is haunted. Not only that, these are known as some of the most haunted places in the country. And what's weird is a lot of these apparitions, ghosts, 
sightings. A lot of them are just ghosts, you know, paranormal activity, stuff like that. Um, you know, Octagon House, everybody knows that one. Stanley Hotel is famous. The Hotel California. And what's weird is a lot of these ghost sightings, damn near all of them, are centered around happenings near elevators. Did you know that U.S. Elevator also built the elevators for the Hotel Cecil? We talked about the Hotel Cecil in L.A. The same elevator where Eliza Lam met her end what would become her end and her bizarre unsolved disappearance. Does this mean that every elevator U.S. elevator built was somehow imbued with whatever energy was in that building? No, but it looks like their fucking luxury elevators were. Every one of them ended up in a place that is known to be one of the most haunted places in the U.S.? What are the odds of that? And these are all activity that are centered around the elevator. Does this prove that U.S. Elevator was haunted, that there was something going on, that there was some kind of energy imbued there, something happened? It doesn't prove it, but it's compelling. All the stories that I grew up hearing. Nobody is going to make a YouTube video or a podcast episode about U.S. Elevator because you know what? That crew was small, they had no turnaround, and it was a very short period of time in near Old Town San Diego, Balboa. It's a very obscure place in a very obscure <laughs> kind of happening. A lot of these guys are no longer around. I only know of three that are left. But they swear up and down to this day that the happenings at U.S. Elevator were in fact real. And I was witness to some of it. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. Matter of fact, well, I'm going to give this a verdict of inconclusive. Because... I can't prove what was happening at U.S. Elevator. I have nothing tangible to say. This is what was going on. All we have are a handful of really, really bizarre stories. Looking at it on Google Maps, man, I almost expected to see that hill. I would never go back to that area, even though it's completely changed now, raised it to the ground, and now with this big industrial park area. Because in my head, I would still see that hill. And I would still see one of my best friends waving goodbye to the world. I would rule it inconclusive because I have no evidence that it happened. There's nothing I can hand you to say, here it is. But what I do have are a bunch of, still to this day, now retired, but honest, good, hard-working, grab-ass and spitting <laughs> guys who did not make up tall tales. And a young guy like me at the time, a tween, basically, who saw a little boy who was this way one day and the next, completely different human being. And I believe him. I believe him. I remember Art. I remember how skinny and frail he got. And I remember the looks on the eyes of the men that said they saw him. They never forgot that. And one of them refuses to talk about it. Still scares the hell out of him to this day. I hope you enjoyed this episode of U.S. Elevator. <laughs> a haunted place that you'll never see in a book, that you'll never watch on YouTube, that you'll never hear on a podcast, except this one. You had to have been there. And for a little time, for a little bit of time, I certainly was. That place will always live in my memory. And those stories will always live in my memory. And just like art in years past, I'm passing this story down to you. Maybe now you have a cool, creepy story to tell your kids. Anyway, guys, next week, uh, let's do another place next week, okay? Because <laughs> I know this, you guys are so cool and accepting about that. I know it's called strange places, right? But we talk about things and paintings and, you know, all that kind of stuff and true crime and music. I just wanted strange places to, which you guys have probably figured out by now. I wanted it to be like a catch-all term, like an unsolved mysteries kind of thing. I made the podcast that I wanted to hear, and it sounds like you guys are really enjoying it. I get messages every day. I appreciate all of you big time. That's all, man. 
I hope you enjoyed this one. I enjoyed making it, even though it kind of, <laughs> you know, could give you goosebumps in a few places just remembering some of this stuff. But anyway, guys, <laughs> I'll catch you later, all right? Make sure to go on Asylum817.com. That's Asylum817.com for all things Strange Places related. All the social media links are there, as well as a link to get to our Patreon account, where you get everything from bonus episodes, giveaways at certain tiers, outtakes, bloopers, all kinds of stuff. Check it out. Shout out to the patrons, by the way. The Cuckle Homestead YouTube channel, Dillagaff, all of our other patrons, I appreciate you. And that's all we got, friends. And, you know, if you want to do that little bit extra, check out the link to The Shaman, available in Kindle and paperback. This is not to plug a book. <laughs> you don't have to buy it if you don't want to. But if you want to get more in the story and hear some stuff that I did not have time to talk about here on the show, it'd be an interesting read, I think, for you if you're into that kind of stuff. Anyway, guys, that's all we got. Are we ever going to run out of strange places to talk about? I don't think so. Because every town has a strange place, and maybe one day, we'll visit yours. 